Hello and welcome to another tutorial by Renderosity on Poser Pro 11 and Poser 11. I'm Mark Bremer. This is going to be a great tutorial that should uh, create a lot of aha moments as we go through it. It's unique in the fact that we are going to be spending very little time in Poser and actually spending more time outside of Poser looking at the images that have been rendered and how to work with them. Specifically, Poser gives you the ability to export all sorts of extra information along with the image that you can then use to further change your image uh, in post-production. This is very, very commonly used in the video editing world and uh, really in still animation or still imagery world if you know how to use it. So let's get going with this. And I need to mention this is an advanced tutorial. If you are new to Poser, please check out many of the free tutorials right here at Renderosity on working with Poser and uh, learn how to get around. All right, let's get going. I happen to have a character, uh, Rex and Roxy, our two favorite uh, Poser characters from days gone by. I'm really moving my mouse over their head here so you can see the fact that the hair is actually modeled hair. What I'm going to be doing is working with something called buffers, and uh, their G-buffers is kind of the industry norm to describe these. Virtually all CG programs export G-buffers, but if you're new or an enthusiast to the CG world, you may not have any idea how to use these things, and this is what we'll uh, cover here. I do need to point out that what we're exploring today is only available in the Pro version of 20, Poser 2014 and the Pro version of Poser 11. If you're looking for a reason to upgrade and you think this might be useful, this could be the uh, demonstration that puts you over the top. So let's get going with it. I just have our basic characters, some set in depth here so we can show that off. So let's take a look at the render settings first of all. I'll point out uh, several things. We're going to come back and look at materials and how scene settings work into this just a little bit. And then we're going to go ahead and render out a scene, export it, and start playing around. I mean, working with the data that comes out. So I happen to have Firefly settings open here in the render settings. And obviously, there's Superfly. They have a little different uh, modes right here. On the Superfly, you'll notice that there's no extra thing for additional information to come out with it. We can enable certain things like caustics and motion blur, those types of things. In Firefly, however, we have something down here called Auxiliary Render Data. When we click on this, you'll see that I've got a, everything enabled here. There's normals, there's tune identification, z-depth, position, blah, blah, you can see it all. Let me explain what these do. I want to call your attention to the fact that there's Custom 1, Custom 2, and Custom 3. Before I set these up and talk about them and before we export into it, I need to point out that Custom 1, 2, and 3 do not work or respect the Superfly render engine. This is really important because if you like the diffuse renders, the regular normal renders that come with the Superfly render engine, you'll need to do a couple renders. One is in Superfly and then to capture all these G buffers, these this extra information we can use after export, you'll need to revert the engine back to Firefly and then do a second render that makes all these separate little files that we'll be using. Let me go ahead and uh, close this right here. I'll say cancel real quick. Now, when I talk about scene settings, let's hop over to materials. And in the materials layout, wow, we get a different layout here for that. Let's come back to pose here. Let's uh, choose, for example, how about, uh, well, just body. For a character's body, uh, and this happens to be Roxy, the woman character in the background. Now when we go to materials, they're getting a better preview. I'll switch this to advanced. And you'll notice here, let me shrink this up a little bit so we can see a little bit better what's going on. Way down at the bottom of this poser surface is something called custom output 1, 2, and 3. As we've learned in other poser tutorials here, you can go ahead and plug anything into any of these inputs or outputs, output to the rendering that is, from any of the nodes you have set up right here. Now this isn't a tutorial on material, so don't worry about that. If you had some material set up that you wanted to map very specifically to a custom output and work with it later after the render in something like Photoshop or GIMP, this is where you would plug it in. And it would create a custom layer for it when we export it. So I bring this up 
because Superfly does not respect 1, 2, or 3 during render time. Only Firefly. Now here's something else. The custom output 1, if something is not plugged into it, the default output from this, this is a lot of words. We'll look at a picture real quickly and it'll make perfect sense. This is going to be the diffuse color of the object on a separate layer. No shadows, no specularity, just the color of the object. Custom Output 2 is specifically specular, the little highlights that show up on objects. And Custom 3 is going to be a dedicated shadow layer that we can go ahead and increase the density of shadows, we can change the color of the shadows, whatever we want to do. There's many ways to work with that. Let me come back to Pose. Now, that was a lot of words to say a lot of things here really quickly. Let's open up the render settings again and talk about these different nodes that we have to work with and maybe give a little better context for that whole idea of output 1, 2, and 3. This is not meant to make your eyes glaze over and um, let me do my best to make sure that doesn't happen. Normal. This is a CG term, computer graphics term, for on the little polygons that make up our character, all those little uh, polygon meshes, if you drew a perpendicular line coming out of every single one of those little squares or polygons, that's called the normal. And that's the direction that, uh, that's just how it's set up. We don't need a history lesson in that. The advantage to working with normals is that this is going to give us the ability to change the lighting in the scene later on. Uh, we can add colored lights to the scene and illuminate a character from the side without having to go back in and re-render. Very cool stuff. The Tune ID has multiple uses. We'll be looking at it in the context of the fact that it automatically, when enabled, assigns a separate layer for each object in the scene and the foremost facing color on it. Now, how do you turn these things on and off? Well, you do it by simply clicking on them with your mouse. When I come back to auxiliary render data, you'll see that Tune has now been unchecked. If I want to enable it, I click it again, and if we come back, we'll see that it's enabled. Z-depth is, you know, the XY-axis in a 3D scene? Well, the Z-depth is what moves away from the camera, further back in space from the camera. Position is where things are in the scene, and we'll explain it with colors. Texture coordinates, I don't think you'll use this too often, but it's something we can export, and we'll take a look at it. But here's the custom one, two, and three. When we export this, or save the image as a Photoshop file, which creates a layered file. It's the only type of image output that respects that. This is where we capture the custom one layer, which is the diffuse color only. Two is the specular, and three is the shadow. I'm going to cancel this real quick so we can come back in here and look. We can see the skin tones on the character, and you know the shirt, we get the shadows here at the bottom of the arm, and where the arm joins the chest. The diffuse layer is only the color, none of the shadow, none of this highlight or anything, pure color. So these highlights we're getting on the character's nose, the highlights on the uh, forehead because of the lights and reflectivity, the diffuse channel, nothing shows up that way. Now the specularity, these little highlights, we're creating a separate output for that so we can control it later. Why is that important? If we want to make them, you know, look like they're sweating or something like that, we can increase the specularity in the render afterwards without coming back into Poser and working with it. All right, again, a bunch of talk. Let's get down to business and go ahead and render this up. I'll go ahead and render, and I've got it set to a, a smaller render, a 64480, so we can go ahead and uh, render a little more quickly here. The interesting thing is, is it will start to see things during the course of the render that you probably do not see in your normal renders, and that's okay. That's what we're doing is creating all this auxiliary data to go ahead and push out from. And there we go. It's adding objects to the scene. We'll uh, see an odd render that's taking place right here as it figures out uh, where the objects are in space. Uh, it's doing a regular render right now, so this is the I guess you would call it the stereotypical render that you would get out of Poser with the Firefly engine. And when this finishes up, we'll see if we're done. It's going much, much slower because it's writing about five times the amount of data that goes with it. So when you engage this or you have strand-based hair, be aware that this render process, when you're saving all this auxiliary information, takes just a little bit longer. So the render's done. Let's come up to File, Export, and image. Now of all the image options we have, 
we are going to want to choose not PNG but Photoshop which is PSD Photoshop document typically you'll see folks exporting to either a ping or a JPEG and I won't get into all the file type discussions right here the reason it has to be a Photoshop document is that's the only format out of all of these that saves this auxiliary information into separate layers so I'll choose this let's call this uh, I don't know R&R &R, Rex and Rocky that'll work it's not Rocky it's Roxy okay got it okay let's come here and open up this render right now R&R &R. looks completely normal right here as I pop this open we'll see it open up in uh, Photoshop right here and here's what I need to disclaim as I get into this the things that you'll see me do in Photoshop usually have counterparts that may or may not be named the same thing in programs like GIMP or Corel Photo Paint and things like that. Photoshop has a bunch of uh, whizmos and they have a tendency to kind of lead the pack um, but anything I'm doing here I believe you can do in any of those other programs I've mentioned and some that I didn't mention. Okay well that's nice. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, close this up maybe a little bit give ourselves a little greater view. Let's look at what's going on in the layers palette here. Now I'll have to tell you this isn't a Photoshop lesson so I'm not going to spend a lot of details talking about the Photoshop tools outside of the context of manipulating this information that has come from Hoser. So what we have right here in or I should say displayed is the regular normal render that comes out of the Firefly engine. So these other layers that are on top are all these specialty layers so you heard me mention normals earlier on how things are kind of set up in the scene well this N for normals they didn't uh, they meaning the poser folks didn't see to actually name it normals when it comes out so you just have to play the mix and match game with with letters here if I turn this on we'll see what's going on in the layer and I want to point out a couple of things while we're looking at this the colors relate to 3d space so you know when you think about the color of your monitor it's an RGB monitor red green blue when you think about 3d space it's XYZ so what they've done is match the color of the normal space to the nomenclature or the angular thing for the <laughs> angular thing how about the space for 3d so red is X you know RGB green is Y and blue is the Z depth so as we go left to right we know that um, the x-axis here kind of moves across our scene uh, left to right y up and down and then z, you know blue for for the z depth goes back that's why our hair is a little more blue back here and angled this way something else I want to point out is that the normal map on export in this modeled hair is showing us all the individual little uh, polygons that make up the character's hair that looks like something else with the the hair because of the transparency maps that are on it. There's some ways to kind of cheat that but I have to point out all these things where the the auxiliary information, the g-buffer information works great and then where it also has some issues. Let's look at some of these others. P4 position. Again uh, top to bottom, left to right. This is a little bit different than normals here as a rule I don't use this too terribly often but it is available and when you see how I start using some of these you're gonna go oh geez I could I could use this to do this and this and you would be right the ID this is the tune ID very dark in the screen right here so what I'm going to do is lighten this up by using something called levels and let me highlight this layer so that I can work on it I'm simply going to brighten this up and as these things export you can change the export it's okay you don't have to use them the way they are we can see the characters kind of being highlighted right here and this gives us the ability inside of the program to use like magic wand tools or color selection tools to very rapidly select different aspects of the characters and I'll just leave it at this for right now and say okay the Z layer the Z depth is going back in space Rex in the front is bright white Roxy back behind is a little bit of gray and then we see as we get further away from the camera it gets darker and darker this is going back in 3D space if we wanted to go ahead and change the levels here I could do that and you'll see what happens when I um, do this our character gets bright if I kind of darken this up we can make it a little more obvious here's something else I want to point out G buffers only typically export with 256 levels of gray 
Why do you care? Well, it's because we get these little jaggy alias types of export functions, and we'll want to blur some of these to kind of disguise the fact that this G buffer is a little lower resolution. If you happen to be working with Photoshop, one thing I encourage you to do is use their feature called Smart Layers. I'm going to right click on Z right here, and it gives me an option to convert to a smart object. This is the same image, same everything, same layer, but what I get to do now is apply filters to it that I can then go back in and re-edit or edit again. So in this case, filter, Gaussian blur, I'll select that. It was one of the last ones I worked with. That's a little too significant. Okay, let me grab the Gaussian blur adjustment, which was off screen from there. And I can come in here and adjust this. And uh, we tune up those edges just a little bit. And she's okay. So now we can see the Gaussian blur showing up underneath uh, the Z layer right here. Completely editable. Nice. Okay. Well, let's start actually doing something with this instead of talking about it. The first thing I want to do is show you how to create lighting from a different side. For example, if we uh, you know, adjusted this and made it kind of cool, let me show you, show you how I might do that. If I want to create a little bit of a a filtered effect in here, I can come up and in, in uh, Photoshop here, I'll go ahead and use some of their special, uh, you know, photo filters. So I pop this open and say, you know, I want a cooling filter. Maybe this is going to be eh, kind of a nighttime scene or something. We might darken it up. I can go ahead and push this up a little bit more and make that look cooler. Okay, great. So we've done that. But what if I wanted warm light coming from the side, like an open door off the image or something? Well, this is where we can come down to the normals layer and start using it. I'm going to turn off our photo filter right here and actually click and drag that to the top of the stack. I didn't show that we've got UV coordinates in here. I'd have flipped that on real quick. And we went through our Z. Here's our custom diffuse one, just the colors. Uh, we've got, let me turn that off. We've got our custom one, and this is specularity. You can't see anything that's going on right here, but let me pop the levels in here, and you will shortly. This will be like the character's eyes, the glints on the forehead that I was talking about. Now they're showing up here a little bit, and we can come back in and leave that, yeah, maybe like that, so it'll show up a little bit more and choose OK. And then finally, if I turn that off, we've got shadows, and we can increase density by multiplying the shadows into the scene. So if I went normal, multiply, we see it darkening up this normal map that's on here. And of course, if we turned that off and went back to the character, we're creating greater density. So anyhow, got a little sidetrack there. Let's come back down to normals. And you can do this for every single G buffer layer that comes out for selection. What I will do here is say, okay, I want color to come, a uh, colored light to come from kind of the left side here. So what I'm going to do is choose select color range, and I'm simply going to eyedropper a color over here. Now that color has been selected, and let me bring in the color range little window right here. In Photoshop, you can go ahead and choose how fuzzy you want that to be and dial that down a little bit if I want. If I happen to do, uh, you know, show the image here, that kind of hides that a little bit. Localized color clusters means just around the face here. So, sorry to make this Photoshop centric, but again, I know there's ways to adjust this in some of those other programs. If I turn off localized color, we're getting the same color sample on everything in the scene. Okay, well that's great. What next? I'll choose those sample colors. They turn into a selection. And what I'll do here then is say, okay, what I would like to do is to create a new hue saturation layer. And I'll go ahead and activate this and I'll say colorize and I'm going to turn it off for the moment here or click on something else. What I need to do is turn off this normal layer so that we can see the underlying layer. Come back up to, well, hue saturation is still selected. What I would like to do is create that warm light. So I'm going to take this slider here and let me increase the saturation a little bit and drag this more into the orange area. And if I wanted to make it a little bit brighter, I could brighten that up. So we see it starting to show up on the character's face here a little bit. We see it showing on their clothes. And you might look at it and go, um, it's, it's okay, but it's a little bit, uh, I don't know, a little too harsh and granular. 
Well, this is the nice part about working with these tools this way. If I close this up right here, and we come down to the layer mask, and I'm going to go ahead and do an option or alt, depending on your system, on the layer mask, we can see what's being masked away that allows the effect to show through. So what we may want to do is actually blur this. So I'm going to option alt, click the mask again, so we see our scene. And I may say, you know what? Let's go ahead and I'm going to right click and say, let's uh, refine this mask a little bit. And let me bring over that option right here. And I'll say, you know what? It's a little too granular. I'm going to go ahead and smooth that just a little bit. And I might feather it just a touch. And I can shift the edge out a little bit if I want. Give it a little bit of a glow to it, in fact, and choose OK. When I come back into the scene, that granularity has kind of gone away. And if I come back to the actual adjustments for that, I can say, you know, I want it to be a little more yellow, a little more saturated. So that's one use of G buffers right there. Obviously, you can kind of dink around with these things all day. If you want to go in and adjust skin tones or clarity or detail, you can do it in much the same way. But here's another one of these little tricks in a combination with the regular render and some of these other G buffers that have exported right here. If we want to go ahead and get these effects so it works on the texture of the hair instead of the polygons. Remember when we came back in and I was showing you just the polygons here, we can see the polygons where the hair is applied or the texture for the hair is applied right there. This is a case where, let me turn this off, you can come back to the regular render. I'm going to create a layers adjustment right above this and simply brighten the scene up a little bit so I can see the hair a little bit better. With that done, I can go ahead and use a magic wand and select highs and darks here in terms of light and apply that to the mask in the hue saturation layer. So there's all sorts of ways to go back and forth between these different methods of selection in here to work with the characters. So that's a very brief introduction to that. But we've talked about modeled hair here. The last thing I want to touch on happens to actually be strand-based hair and how that renders out. I've already done a render with uh, some of the, the G buffers in there. So let me go ahead and pop back into our scene here real quick and simply open up the strand hair render. Just a simple sphere. We've got uh, some clumping hair and all these types of things. You get the idea. When we apply the normals map here or take a look at it, again, red is right, RGB, green is the yellow, and blue, we don't see much, but it's going back in Z space. Also, for the custom 1, 2, and 3, the diffuse color, no highlights. The custom color right here, which happens, or custom 2, which happens to be specular, if I happen to go, okay, let's uh, turn this up and go to something like linear dodge. And that will brighten these areas if I turn that off and on now. We can see that's working. If I, and this is the custom one of the diffuse layer. If I turn that off and we turn off normals, we'll see that we get the specularity now for the custom two. And if I was a smart person, I would say, let's rename this to specular and diffuse. Oh, I should spell that right. Hmm? I know if I don't, that will bother a certain segment of our population. And then we've got shadows. there. So we just increase specularity. The nice thing is, is I can go in and adjust this a little bit, bring that up or down. And with shadow, if I engage that here, I would go ahead and turn shadows into a darken layer right here so it doesn't get darker than the darkest area, but it creates a little density change here. And I can go ahead and change how significant that is. What does that mean back here for our characters? Let me turn off this levels adjustment turn back on our, our fake light from the side. There's lots of nice ways to blend this light in here. The hue saturation is at the normal setting right here, the normal layer blending. If we wanted to change that and instead do something like lighten so we get more of the underlying character showing through or turn it to something more like a soft light or in fact something like a hard light or overlay, we get these different lighting qualities that come with the different blending modes we're working with. And then also, we can go ahead and just change the opacity for that layer here. So if I bring that down, we can do some real subtle adjustments in there and really dial up the scene. Likewise, if I wanted light from the right that would be brighter or more blue or something from a street light, 
we could go in and fix that. So there's an introduction into working with some of these auxiliary outputs or buffers that we have to work with. And if we come back to Poser, I need to just come back and say you get to those in Firefly, Auxiliary Render Data. And if you want the benefits of a Superfly color render here, then you'll need to render in Superfly, come back in to Firefly, and then go ahead and uh, do the, the various G buffers or select the ones that you want out of this mix. I will say again that in the Superfly render, if you connect output modes to output 1, 2, and 3 to get a specific channel, and let me explain what that means. Big words, but I think if you're interested in this, you're following me. If, for example, I wanted to highlight the color of this shirt here, I could actually map that color input or texture input to an output channel and have the shirt show up by itself as a separate layer inside of Photoshop or GIMP, allowing me all sorts of other things I could do. Uh, lots of fun. I know you'll have fun playing with this. Thanks for joining me on this little trip into Poser.